good morning everybody um just giving it a couple more seconds um to allow people to to join in so uh, we will begin in uh, in a few seconds So good morning everybody and uh, welcome to the Corrosion Prevention Association Ask the Specialist session. Um, this is the second um, in our series run by the Structural Concrete Alliance, last week being the concrete repair um, and next week being the spray concrete. Um, can I take this opportunity just to run through some housekeeping bits? Um, please feel free to use the chat uh, facility, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I think we're all pretty well versed in uh, using Zoom now, but um, if not, you will find it at the bottom of your screen. Um, please feel free to put the, the questions in at any time during this webinar. Um, it will be constantly monitored um, and questions will be asked um, to the panelists. Also, there is a questions and answers section. Um, again, feel free to put your questions in there. Um, they will be monitored, so it doesn't matter which ones um, you choose to do so on there. This uh, webinar is recorded. Um, it will only be shared um, on the Structural Concrete Alliance website and the CPA website. Um, so obviously, nobody will be seen on this website, just the panelists. Um, if we don't get through all the questions, they will be answered um, in a post recording. Um, this will be sent around to you individually and also posted on websites and the Alliance YouTube channel. So please do look out for that, but we will send you a message um, just to flag that up in case we don't get through all the questions. Um, can I just draw your attention at the moment to the Competition Act? We're, again, we are all uh, fairly well versed in that as well. Um, but if we feel any of the questions are um, contentious, we, we, we will um, not ask that question. Um, so just be mindful of that, please. Um, so I'm just gonna move on to a quick introduction about the Alliance, uh, very quick, because obviously I know you're all keen to, uh, to get to the questions and answer the session. So the Alliance, uh, for those of you that don't know, brings together the Concrete Repair Association, the Corrosion Prevention Association, and the Sprayed Concrete Association. It provides a single coordinated voice and source of reference for the structural concrete refurbishment and repair industry. Um, through events and training and technical guidance, the Alliance promotes best practice to the industry and wider. So please do, I encourage you to keep an eye on the Structural Concrete Alliance website, especially now we're um, able to have some more face-to-face -face, um, things going forward. Uh, we do uh, seminars, demo days, practical demo days, um, as I say, there's this technical guidance always coming out and, uh, and the training as well, uh, which we are really uh, focusing on at the moment. So now to the most important part of the webinar, I know you're very excited to get to this part. Um, it's the question and answer session. Um, so we're just going to have a quick introduction of the specialists. So Chris, over to you for your introduction. Hi everyone, my name is Chris Atkins. I uh, work at Mott McDonald in the Materials and Technology Unit. I've spent 20 ish years working on corrosion of steel and concrete. I've got a PhD, I'm a fellow with the Institution of Civil Engineers, and I'm a fellow with the Institute of Corrosion. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everybody. My name is David Simpson. I work for Vector Corrosion Technologies. Um, I'm a corrosion engineer for my sins. I look after our R&D, um, so heavily involved in corrosion management and solutions towards corrosion. I suppose I've worked in the industry for about 20 years, and that's me for my sins. Over to you, Graham. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, I'm uh, Graham Stanford. Uh, I'm the technical services manager at Volker Laser. Uh, where I advise on all sorts of things. And, and one of those is uh, corrosion uh, and corrosion projects, um, uh, really giving the contractors perspective on, on the specialist side today. Back to you, Lauren. Thanks guys. Um, you will see um, that we are missing one of the panelists. Unfortunately, Ken Dykes um, has taken ill today. So um, we, are, we are missing Ken, um, but it's okay. These three will uh, cover the questions quite nicely. I do promise you. 
Um, so what I will do, um, panelists, I will read out the questions for you. Um, Chris might need some help on some of the, uh, <laughs> the terminology. Uh, they think are dyslexic for this. I, I never know why, um, but I will try my best. Um, it will be um, a random thing, guys. So I will put the questions to you. If it's something you feel you can't answer, please just pass on to, uh, to a colleague, but we will do our best to answer them all. These are the questions that have been pre-submitted um, from, from you guys watching the webinars or, or other people within the industry. Um, but as I say, please feel free to use that chat as well and we will try and get to all the questions. Okay, so the first one, here we go. Uh, which non-destructive tests are used to monitor corrosion in non-adherent and adhered pre-tested cables inserted in metal sheaths? So who would like that? I think I'm gonna go Graham. I always love to be first. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, the, the, the biggest issue with post-tensioned um, cables in, in, in metal sheaths is obviously they're, they're shielded. So it is actually really very difficult to uh, do non-destructive tests uh, to monitor corrosion in, in, that, in that situation. Uh, I mean, obviously we can locate them uh, using Ferroscanner and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and there are various things that you can you can you can look at in terms of treating that in the future but to actually do that is is not only possible so you you generally have to locate and then you do have to go into into the the duct to to get at uh, the the cable uh, to peel back the duct uh, and it's really to do with the the, the non grouting uh, of post tension cables uh, and that is still a prevalence of that on on structures uh, i don't think from there's there's a lot more i can say on that really it's very very difficult to do it non-destructively anybody else got any points on that um just that there's a syria guide been produced on non-destructive testing of concrete fairly recently and it broadly comes to the same conclusion that there's not that much you can do agree okay great thank you guys um, moving on, number two, can you please describe the impact of concrete, oh, you give me words, resistivity <laughs> on the cathodic protection system in general, and especially in case of sacrificial anodes used both in the installation and refurbishment? So we are going to go for this one. <laughs> Thanks. Dave. Okay, so this is a really, really broad question. I mean, I'll try, I'll try and break it down, I guess, into its three, three component parts. I mean, the first one is concrete resistivity is never stable over a structure. It's going to vary depending on the environment. It's going to depend on the element of the, of the structure. And normally that's related to uh, moisture content. It's related to the amount of chloride that's already got into the structure. And both of those really reduce the resistivity of the of the concrete and we have to take them into account i suppose when we're looking at any cathodic protection um system but typically we're quite lucky because obviously where you have reduced resistivity you have more water you have more chloride those reduced resistivity and obviously relate to corrosion risk so typically where we have that high moisture where we have that high chloride you're going to have the highest ultimate corrosion risk typically on the structure um you can monitor resistivity um, over a structure I mean it's notoriously inaccurate in terms of what it is but if you if you look at it for what it is and look at the delta the difference between the values it may give you an indication and as with any other technique to, to monitor corrosivity and risk of corrosion on structures most of the time it's probability and you have to combine various methods to be able to um, assess it properly I would say so it is only a probability um, but again, typically it's related to those change in moisture and chloride, which gives us a good indication of risk. Um, I think we have to break down um, the two different variants of, of cathodic protection. So impressed current cathodic protection and galvanic, because there are sort of slightly different um, elements that we have to consider. But when we're sort of designing an ICC P system, Obviously, resistivity would impact the number of zones and the size of zones that you would look to do. Obviously, what you don't want to do is have um, really low resistivity area in a bigger patch because what would happen is all the current would be um, dumped or passed into that one zone. You wouldn't get equal current distribution. So I think uh, in terms of ICCP, understanding where your, your probably your wettest areas and most corrosive areas are would help you in terms of the design. Um, perspective when you're looking at, at repair materials um, going into a structure for ICCP 
my personal preference and, and the guys may uh, may jump in here my personal preference is always to go with something with a with a higher resistivity typically you want something that's that's similar to the parent concrete if not higher because when you do the repair um you're cutting out all the chloride contaminated concrete you're stopping corrosion so you don't really need current going to the steel in the repair you want the current passing to the remainder of the concrete uh, where you still have chlorides and you still have that corrosion risk. So those are probably the two broad ones from a repair situation for ICCP or impressed current control protection. From a galvanic perspective, things have changed quite a lot, I think, over the past 20 years. Initially, um, well, just the premise, galvanics have a limited voltage. And if you think of Ohm's law, your current is related to resistance. So the, the higher your resistance, the lower your current. So people were concerned that if we had very high resistivity concretes, then you would limit the performance of galvanic systems. And there were figures originally used at around 15 kilo ohm centimeter initially. Um, but over the past sort of 20 years, I think that's changed and, and, and most material manufacturers now state up to 50 kilo ohms a centimetre, which is, which is much higher. And I think that really covers sort of the most flowable and most hand applied materials. Um, I think typically you'd want to keep away from anything that's epoxy or insulative like mag phosphate materials, because they always, those are insulative and are not compatible with cathodic protection really. So I hope that gives you a bit of a, a, a round in one for me. Um, the last point, just to just to state on the sort of new construction point, obviously with new construction, you don't have corrosion from day one. Therefore, the amount of current you need to provide protection or cathodic prevention, as it's termed, is far lower. And therefore, resistivity has less of an impact for both an ICCP, on press current cathodic protection, and a galvanic point of view, really. But both of them will need a proper design no matter what happens. But those are some of the things that a designer would probably take into account when they're they're looking to produce a, a design for cathodic protection. So that's everything for me. Anybody else got anything to add? Chris, Graham? No, I don't think so, no. No, oh, I think you covered it well. Try my best. Thanks, Dave. Very thorough answer there. So I hope that answered the question um, for, for the person that submitted it. So going on to number three, um, is there guidance or experimental threshold value on limits of electrochemical, uh, sorry, electrical, this word again, of concrete <laughs> with respect to cathodic protection? Well, I, I, I could probably answer that actually, if Thanks, you want, Graham. because I can come up with an equally long answer uh, like Dave has just done with the answer, no. <laughs> there isn't. Um, there are some good uh, sort of scholarly articles on it. Um, the, I think there's one in uh, 2018. I, I forget who who did it, uh, but there's a if you if you Google that actually on on the internet, uh, I, and I can find it and I can post the link later. There's a the, there was an article done. I think it's a Springer link, um, and I think they talked about sort of 18 to sort of eight kilo uh, kilo ohms to centimeter. So I mean I think probably you know, but then you talked a minute ago david about 50 so i mean it, 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 there is no guidance now but I think there's the also issue, a difference yeah. of opinion as well <laughs> well the reason i think you have to remember that most testing that's done is done at 28 days saturation the yes. issue you have on structures is it's always varying depending whether you're in the winter depending whether you're in the summer and depending whether you're like in a marine environment or whether you're in just a normal bridge so it's a very difficult thing to assess is is really the point of Thank you guys. So moving on to question four, there has been a continuous debate about the risk of corrosion of fully submerged steel members. Um, the, the, the question, uh, sorry, the, the person asking the question would like to hear the panel's recommendations about this subject. Can I take that? You can take that, Chris. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, for me, the, there's a relationship between corrosion and oxygen availability most most of the time, which is why, frankly, they could find the Titanic. Because if you think about it, that's been sat at the bottom of the ocean for kind of 110 or so years, but still existed. So the corrosion rate does depend on oxygen availability and when it's permanently submerged, there's less oxygen. That being said, in some environments, you can get microbial induced corrosion, which gives you a much higher corrosion rate. So most of the time, it's not a problem. For stealing concrete, I don't think I've ever been involved in repairing buried steel reinforcements in concrete. That being said, there are evidence 
examples of pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipes that are corroding and got cathodic protection on them. So it, it's it still happens is the problem. So you can't just say it's never going to happen because it does occasionally happen um, for permanently submerged just conventional steel work. The corrosion rate will certainly decrease typically when it's submerged. But there are examples where you'll get a more accelerated corrosion because the environment changes because there is a lack of oxygen. You then get a proliferation of microbes. Anybody got anything else to chip in? I think the only other thing to, to, to add is obviously that's the submerged section, but um, obviously you have that, that intermediate section, which is obviously the, the, the sort of splash, splash zone, zone yeah. and tidal zones. And I know this talks specifically about submerged, but again, those areas tend to be high, high risk in terms of steel section loss. Yeah. Great, thanks guys. I was just checking the questions um, that we've had submitted um, live just to make sure there's no uh, links between the questions, but we're all good. So we'll continue with the pre-asked pre, uh, pre -asked ones. So, oh, long one here. Okay, so number five, my question is about interface bond in between parent concrete and cementaceous repair materials. Typical application would be uh, seaward facing vertical surfaces of fender beams of a marine, uh, mar marine jetty where repairs are intended to be carried out. EN 150410 suggests a minimum bond strength of 175215 PSI for structural concrete repairs. <clears throat> what measures would be taken if substrate tensile bond strength is much below above numbers and typically around 0.7 MPA? and any solutions based on real time experience. Who would like that one? <laughs> Don't all rush at once. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, uh, there's a very rude saying, which I won't say at the moment, but you know, to a certain extent, you have to deal with what you've got. You know, you can't actually make concrete stronger if it's not stronger. Having said that, in this situation, there are things you can do, but initially the most sort of important thing to do is is to ensure your bond. Now, if the if if, if the substrata doesn't have the bond, you can't make something that it, it can't do. So, really, in those situations, it's trying to get. Uh, or trying to ensure that you can get behind the steel so that you've, you've actually got steel the surface roughness is is, is as good as it can be um, making sure that the pull off, pull off tests give you the right sort of figures but also to realize that once you've sort of taken off the sort of delaminated uh, material uh, if there if there is delamination i mean if it's if it's a weak concrete and it's it's got chloride in it i mean this is actually more of a concrete repair question rather than a cathodic protection question really um but what you're trying to do i mean you can't you can put uh, you know drill and fix sort of inert fixings to to give you some extra um bond into the material and try and get into a stronger part of the material but when all is said and done if you've got 0.7 megapascals you've got 0.7 megapascals and you, you, you your choice is to treat that repair it and deal with what you've got or to replace, uh, replace the, if it's a column, for instance, replace the column, which isn't necessarily ideal. But if your material is fairly solid once you've got the delamination off, it's obvious and it's in repair state and it's been there quite a long time, you're going to have to assume to a certain extent that the material is strong enough to withstand what it's got to withstand, but it's not going to meet the, 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 the requirements of EN 1504. But sometimes you have to deal with what you've got. So uh, unless anybody else has got a better answer to that, I think that's probably, you know, it is what it is. I think that's, I think that's pretty much everything, really. You can only deal with what you've got to deal with. And this, is, this to me, is when it becomes an engineering solution as opposed to a tick the box for an EN standard. That, this is the real world, and this is what you have to deal with. And sometimes we have to come out with solutions that go outside of the norms, really. And yeah. That's just the reality of, of being an engineer. Yeah, I mean, you might you might find in a situation like uh, a column, for instance, particularly uh, you know on a marine jetty, that you might have to put some form of uh, sheath around uh, the the column with the with, and grout that sheath up, and that's what does happen sometimes because then you're not reliant necessarily on the the parent material, but you're reliant on the sheath itself to to give you withstand some of that. I mean, we have in my, my sort of career we have uh, I've looked at uh, with companies I've worked with the use of ultra high fiber fiber reinforced concrete sheaths around uh, structures or even steel sheaths around structures to, to give them additional strength 
Um, but realistically, if you've got 0.7 megapascals and you it, and it's not falling over and you can repair and you can get a good bond by roughing the surface, making sure that you get rid of micro cracks, uh, make sure that you get your compaction, your curing right, then then it's going to extend the life. And and realistically, repairing is about extending the life, as is as is co corrosion control, about extending the life of what we've already got. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Can I just yeah. chip in? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Go on, Chris. The, the issue, something like that typically arises when you're on site within a contract for repair. And at that point, there is a problem fundamentally with the specification because if you only get a 0.7 out of the substrate, you're never going to get 1.1. So there's no point specifying 1.1. So the client needs to go back, take the information and get a structural engineer involved to make some decisions based on what they've actually got. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the only thing I can think of to add to that was really just, obviously, I'm pretty sure this, this person who answered the question has tested the, 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 ten, uh, the tensile bond strength or the tensile strength of the concrete over multiple areas. Because sometimes, as we know, when you build structures, they're not built homogeneously, they're building sections. So you might find this may just be one section of the, of the structure that is that they have a problem it may not be the case with other areas of the structure so see whether it's a localized problem or whether it's a, a global problem yeah good point okay yeah thank, thank you guys um right i'm going to mix it up a bit here don't panic i'm going to throw one in from the chat to you guys um so the question is can acoustic monitoring be an option yeah that question came in when we were talking about post tensioning and pre-stressing um, it is used for measuring, for listening to cracks forming, propagating in pre-stressing wires, but the difficulties are that you don't know what state it's in when you've started unless you started when the structure was first built. So you don't know if you've got any pre-existing failures. It only monitors while it's on and monitoring, and you can get an awful lot of other signals happening in concrete because it's a cracked material anyway, so you get a level of background noise that you have to filter out. So it, it can be quite difficult to detect. It is used for that, but it, it's it's slightly more complex than some of the sales brochures suggest. I, I still think largely it points you in the right direction of where to do destructive tests, if, if anything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that is the point, Graham. I think, I think whatever testing, whether it's sonic, ultrasonic, void detection, it's only going to pinpoint you to a probability of, of an area of that's of concern, and therefore you're still going to have to evaluate it by physically doing breakouts. And that's yeah. the, so I, I, there are techniques out there that help pinpoint and help build a, a risk profile on these structures. But again, you're not going to get away without doing any some sort of destructive testing, investigation testing. Um, I don't I mean, like the word destructive testing because it shows that you're going to destroy the structure, but it's more, more yeah. going in there and you've got to get think, your hands on. I think from the point of view of post-tension um, ducting and stuff like that, you know, what we know is that in the past, post-tension ducts uh, by whoever they were put in by were not terribly well grouted um at times um and they're usually um in the high points um where they've not been able to push the grout up to um and it, uh, and set you know there's been separation of water and, and the cementitious project product in the past the water has re re remained in that uh, situation so yeah, but very often you know the, the tendons will be okay. They might not be perfect, but they're going to be okay. But and the key then becomes that the regrouting, and then when you're regrouting, it's the issue of the um, the material you're putting back in there, um, and then starting to look at sort of incipient anode effect within the grouting uh, within the duct. So uh, so that that it, it, it's a whole it, it's quite an interesting subject actually because it really leads to a lot of other questions. Yeah. Which wasn't the question that he didn't answering, but I thought I'd mention it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> <Ta -da! laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Thank you guys for, uh, for, <laughs> for the answer and Graham for going that little bit extra. Um, so I'm just going to refer the panelists to the questions and answers tab. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if you just click on the tab which says answered and scroll down to the bottom, there is a question that has been submitted in relation to number five, which is still on your screen. So referring to the previous question on adherence, the question I would like uh, to put to the experts is um, it effectively the poor concrete or is the poor cleaning of the substrate or the micro cracks generated by oh, to heavy cleaning equipment? 
For, for me, if you're getting a bond of 0.7, either you've not done any surface preparation at all, or the, the purring concrete is just not not up to the strength required. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if, if you're... you've gone on it really heavily with a breaker, then you may well have destroyed the concrete while trying to do the present to the surface preparation, which is the point Guido refers to. Yeah, I mean, let's be honest, most concrete, not all concrete for sure, on big concrete repair jobs is taken out by hydro demolition. Um, so you're not tending to get quite so much micro cracking from that as you would from heavy breakers going going at it. Um, but I think you're right, you know, poor cleaning of the substrata, maybe, but it's more likely to be the concrete itself, I would suggest. And the, the, yeah. the thing is, I mean, if, if you're using a method to break out the concrete, then you're going to use that method everywhere. So in, in a way, that's the reality, the new reality you've created. So, I mean, you you want to test for that, but I mean, if, if it is causing problems at the surface, it's going to cause problems at the surface everywhere. So you're sort of like, it's, it's like you want to use the best method, I guess, and make sure you're not doing that. But if you are, then that's what you're going to get. So that's the reality of what the bond, the, the, the strength will be, the bond strength will be. Okay. You want to keep on answering these, uh, Lauren, in the question and answer section? I think it's probably worthwhile, isn't it? We can do, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the one, the one, the one on the next one above was on resistivity. Um, type one anodes, galvanic anodes. I mean, I'm, I don't believe there's personally a limit on what you can use. That's my that's my my point of view. I think these some of these things are introduced into these specifications to make sure people think about it first. But then sometimes that causes more problems than it is because people think that, well, what happens if I'm at 15.1? Is it out now or is it in? Um, so the question was really, really, is it less than five or greater than 15? And I'd say in the past, it was sort of like a limit was set at 15. I think they're absolutely suitable. As a designer, you just want to make sure that if you're on the higher end, then you consider that as part of your design calculations. If you're on the lower end, you've got to think about life expectancy. So obviously the lower resistance, the higher the current, therefore your life is going to be impacted from a galvanic perspective. So, I mean, I don't think anything is a no other than epoxies, magphosphate materials, uh, epoxy bonding agents. All those things will have an impact on the performance, but... Um, that, that that would be my answer. There's no there's no no answer. Um, it's just really how you design it and what the implications of that material are going to be on. And that's typically where the the corrosion engineer would have to 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 recommend and work with the contractor or the the engineer in terms of what materials they're looking to use. Really similar from me. I mean, this may refer to it's, it. The question uses the phrase packing mortar. So it's, if a proposed sacrifice lamp system uses a packing mortar. As a lower resistivity. Okay, yeah. What series 5700 says it's got to be between 5 and 15. The packing mortar might relate to the basic stuff that you put immediately around the anode and then carry on with the more conventional repair around it. Yeah, I think I, I think I think it's acceptable. Yeah, I think we we I think my company is a bit a bit responsible for that because I think it was one of those things that was a concern and therefore we called it a bridging mortar. So you could pack the anode around with a lower resistive material to get the uh, the current outside of the patch. And I think that was a, an, an interim period where this was of concern. We've obviously um, moved on from that in terms of what we what we allow now, and that's increased to 50 kilo ohm centimeter, which I think again covers a much broader range of products to, to use really. I mean, it's, it's imp important to note that the oldest project for galvanic systems in repair scenario is 21 years old now, and that was repaired using a dry spray material, which they're, they're, <laughs> they're notoriously well above a hundred kilo ohm centimeter. And that system has been performing for 21 years now. So that's the reality of it. As we get more data, um, I think we've extended the range in terms of what, what resistivity we can use with galvanic systems. All right, you want to continue on the uh, the questions and answers one. So the one above that is, sorry, they're coming in thick and fast. So I'm trying to- 19, uh, so Do you want me to pick up Ian's question? Yeah, sure. 1970s building reinforced concrete slab, no cover on the exposed face, by a sea front with clear evidence of corrosion due to water ingress and a defective cavity tray the slab was not repaired properly water ingress has worsened to the point where the boot lintel was not doing its job a new steel boot was inserted with lead cavity tray beneath sitting on the existing concrete boot 
the concrete reinforced boot has not been repaired, is this effective? Um, if you've got, if it's by the seafront, it's probably chloride induced corrosion as well as a lack of cover. So to me, it just sounds like they put stuff back in a hole. So I don't think that repair would meet the requirement to BSEN 1504 because it says find out the problem and come up with a strategy. And that, that just sounds like they put stuff back in a hole. You'd yeah. need more details to comment specifically, but yeah, that's a, that's a no from me. Yeah. I think the main point one is they haven't even identified whether it's chlorides or what the cause of corrosion is. They've just seen evidence of corrosion. It could be a whole host of things. And obviously the answer is going to depend upon what type of corrosion it is, really. Yeah. Grand. Thank you, guys. I think, I think the next question is quite an interesting one, actually. Uh, I'll have a go at that if nobody minds. Um, so has any compatibility testing been carried out to evaluate CP performance with ultra high steel fiber reinforced concrete cast in place of sprayed? So for those that haven't dealt with ultra high uh, fiber reinforced concrete, ultra high strength fiber reinforced concrete, um, that material uh, is an incredibly strong um, concrete. Um, it's, it's, anything up to sort of 180 megapascals uh, when it's when it's in use um, but it's fundamentally concrete uh, or the, it, it, it's made from sort of ground material uh, the, the typical um, version of that would be ductile um, or what they call beef up uh, concrete ductile um, and that's basically very very um, dense and material Material full of steel fibers. So I don't know. The answer is I don't know that any compatibility testing has been carried out to, to evaluate that. But when you look at it, it don't seem like a very good idea because <laughs> it, it's so full of um, discontinuous uh, metal that it's 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 really not going to be a very good product. I wouldn't have thought for compatibility with CP. But Chris, you probably can answer that better than even than me. Yeah. The Generally, for any cathodic protection job, we avoid using fiber, steel fiber in first yeah. reinforced yeah. because you've got short circuit risk and a straight current risk. So we exactly. might make all the steel fibers yeah. grow and we might short the anode out. Yeah, yeah. I don't so, think that matters between ICCP or galvanics. I think the answers are identical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and to be honest, if you're using that sort of material, um, it depends how you're using it. Uh, I know SM. Uh, uh, you and I have both used that material, uh, been involved with that material uh, in our past jobs. Um, and it's a really good material for repairing structures. Um, but there is an issue, actually. Uh, the biggest issue with that material um, is if you're using it as a, as a shield, if you like, or as a, a permanent um, reinforcement to the outside of a column. And then you've got a column maybe inside with corrosion going on. Yeah. Um, and then you grout it up. How do you deal um with that uh that material uh yeah. the, or the corrosion that's expanding inside the use of that that shield um and the answer is uh, it's not been done yet but it could certainly be done particularly on precast type side of things um but it is going to give you it is going to give you problems with that I think, the, I think the other thing to add on to that is obviously as an engineer as a corrosion engineer you have to think of the future yes. and if you're doing repair You've got to think, well, maybe I want to use cathodic protection later on in, in, the, in the life of this structure. And what this would do is make sure you can't. And typically, if nobody's got an idea of what's going to be done and what's been put there, then that's going to be a problem, really. Um, so I think yeah. you just have to think about the future proofing of, of structures in terms of what the ultimate life is, really, and what yeah. systems you're going to limit. limit For to sure. But I, what I would say, and I mean, you know, we don't actually use it in my company now but uh, it, it has got a huge amount of benefits and potential for repair of structures and when you start looking at say switzerland they use an awful lot of this material um, because obviously the, the the effectiveness of ultra high fiber ultra high strength fiber reinforced concrete um, you need to use considerably less of it where you might need 50 mil as opposed to 450 mil so it, it has its place definitely and there are some structures out there that would benefit greatly from it because it's very expensive but you use so much less of it so you know i, I wouldn't ignore its use but it needs a bit of thinking about from the corrosion of the actual structure that's already there in compatibility with it but you're not going to get cp to go through it if that makes sense okay <laughs> Uh, I, I see the question from Murdash. Yes, I'll send a link to that 
uh, Springer's reference literature. Great, thank you, Graham. Um, okay, so we'll pop back to the uh, the pre-submitted questions now. So number six, can cathodic protection reverse corrosion? A nice simple one for me to read, but I hope it's <laughs> simple to answer, guys. No. <laughs> <laughs> in, in some respects, it, it sort of does. So when you're electroplating metal, you basically make the steel a cathode and, and have the right solution, and then you can plate metal onto one of the electrodes. That won't happen for steel in concrete, so you won't be able to plate the steel back. What it does do is generate alkalinity around the steel and pull chlorides away from the steel. So in some respects, it sort of reverses the things that cause the corrosion in some cases, but won't plate metal back. Anyone good else answer. got any thoughts on that? No, I think that's no, a good answer. Super. Good answer. Yeah. Next one. Chris. Okay, moving on to question seven. If my magic will flip on for me. <laughs> Compatibility of pre-stressed and post-stressed. I think we'll probably all answer this one a little bit, to be honest with you, but I'll, I'll jump in if you want. Um, I mean, CP, is, I think for me, has always been compatible with these. It's not a compatibility issue, it's a risk issue. Um, and always what you have to make sure with 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 pre-stress and post-stress structures is make sure that you've got a lot of scrutiny when it comes to the design and when it comes to the long-term monitoring of this really because obviously what they're what you're what the historically we've been concerned about is more about um um hydrogen embrittlement taking the potential of the steel more negative than one volt which obviously the, there's a sort of risk there when you've got high stressed elements within those elements but and typically galvanic systems are always pushed and said, oh, they've got a low voltage, therefore they've got a low risk of causing this as a problem. Um, but I think the latest data, which has come out of Sheffield Harlem Uni, I think it's a, it's a pretty new paper actually, has basically come up with, with, with the calculation that the, limb, the risk is, is virtually zero really in, in terms of the, the normal operating conditions of cathodic protections and even over protection. So I think it's, it's a theoretical issue more than it is a... Uh, a, a practical issue, but that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't uh, be um, due diligent over how we monitor it and the things we put in place if we are going to consider cathodic protection with both of these types of structure. Anybody else got anything to add on that? Um, just that it can be a bit tricky to do on post tension structures because the tendons in a duct. Yeah, yeah. So it, it can be physically hard, but with pre stressed concrete, we initially just didn't think it was going to corrode because it was built in a factory. It turns out that it didn't corrode because it hadn't passed its 40th birthday and now it's getting a bit old and saggy like the rest of us. So we're, we're having to do more CP of pre-stressed and post-tension concrete. Um, yeah. And I've used impressed ones and galvanic systems on both. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Speak for yourself on that one, to be honest. <laughs> right, we'll uh, move on to question eight, guys. Um, can cathodic protection be used in new construction? I'll take that one. Thanks. If that's all right with everybody, I sounded a bit keen. Then, didn't I? Um, yes, it can. Yes, it is a good solution because part of the difficulty in installing cathodic protection on reinforced concrete is checking all the steels electrically continuous and then installing the anodes. And if you can do that before the concrete's been placed, it's a lot easier. It also means you need less current to stop the steel from actively corroding. Then you need less current to stop it from starting to corrode than you do to stop it from actually corroding. That being said, if you've got a major development, you don't know where the salt's going to start leaking in. So one approach that's taken quite a bit in the Middle East is to make all the steel electrically continuous, have little test connections so that you can do tests to look for corrosion. And then if the salty water gets into the basement in one corner, you can just turn it on or look at seeping that one corner a lot more simply than installing anodes everywhere. I've just produced a fairly recent paper looking at embodied carbon. And basically, if you stop the steel from rusting in the first place, you get a huge benefit in embodied carbon and waiting 30 years and start, it started to grow. Anybody got any more on that? No, I, th I think there are huge benefits of, of do, using cathodic protection from day one instead of turning it on once the system started corroding because you, as you've mentioned before, Chris, for, for me, it's that build-up of alkalinity, which 
is the natural barrier to corrosion. So we always talk about the chloride to hydroxyl ratio uh, in terms of the initiation of corrosion. So anything that you can do to build hydroxyl ions and alkalinity at the, at the interface between the steel and the concrete is always going to prolong the structure long term and obviously when the when when the charge is being passed on the steel then it's going to be more difficult for chloride even to get to the steel during that time so i think there's a there's there's, there's benefits of both but i think um that's the only thing i can add yep graham have you got anything there's a question just coming to on the chat if you if you've got nothing to answer cp on new construction we'll pick that up if that's yeah yeah, yeah 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 good, good, good um isam asks where are we standing today with assessing corrosion rates in post tensioning strands um, it's very difficult to do because the tendons are in ducts and because of the types of steel that you've got with post-tension tendons, you don't want them to corrode at all because they have a kind of nasty habit of developing cracks and failing catastrophically. So where we are today is still effectively, if you're building something from new using post-tension, and that's how big bridges are built. We use post segmental post-tension construction all over the world. Um, you, you try and make sure that there is no corrosive environment around the post-tensioning. If you've got an existing structure and you're trying to assess whether the post-tensioning is corroded, it's tricky. There's nothing you can do realistically, non-destructively to look at the corrosion rate in post-tension strands. You then start to look for voids in the ducts and in the concrete and the presence of salty water in the vicinity of a void in the duct and possibly break it out to expose through the duct to confirm that the tendons are adequately grafted. I suppose. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say that there is sort of, I guess one codicil to that may be in that you might not be able to monitor the duct, uh, the duct, the tendon in the duct. Um, but what actually happens quite a lot of the time, or there, there are opportunities is to monitor the, the, the post tension head. And uh, you, I, don't, I know that doesn't really help uh, the tendon is up, but you can you can monitor the corrosion around the sort of the anchor uh, and the and the the, the, yeah, the tendons yeah. in that using the, what LPR meters or, or whatever you know. I mean, the, the and tip, and tip, go on, yeah, and typically that's that's one of the worst areas because they tend to be poorly grouted as the as the grout comes up and they finish them off. They tend to be quite a lot of voiding in there, and again, if water's ever going to get in. It's going to be in those sections. So mm. we've seen, especially in sort of marine environments, and when they've been around sort of leaky joints, those areas can fail. It doesn't matter whether the, the tendon is is forty or hundred meters long. If the, if you fail at the anchor point, it's failed. So that, that there's, I think, there's more more investigation and, and and solutions you can have for the for the anchor points if you can get to them uh, than than the tendons. There is, there is a system recommended by the FIB. Um, where you electrically isolate the tendons from the reinforcement cage and then measure the resistance between the tendons and the reinforcement cage. Uh, I think it's got about 10 years worth of experience. And so far, we've got lots of numbers. We're not entirely sure what they mean, but the bridges haven't fallen down. So it, it, it's there are things that people think can be measured. Yeah. But interpretation on an actual structure, it gets more and more tricky. But importantly, as we noted in, in Italy, when it does... When it does fail, it fails. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Um, um, <coughs> just to let Murdash know, I've sent the link um, for the article to you and uh, Chloe, Lauren, so that's that's already with you. Perfect. Well, we will forward it on. Thank you, okay. okay, moving on to question nine. Uh, is cathodic protection sustainable? A hot topic at the moment. Well, it has been for some time. So who would like that one? Okay, I'll, I'll do that if you want. Thanks, um, yeah. <laughs> for me, it's you have to ask yourself the question, what is sustainable? And, and, and realistically, when it comes to concrete structures, uh, is, you know, knocking down a structure and recasting new structures with, with concrete uh, sustainable? No, because we're trying to reduce carbon, and and that that's that's a major major issue uh, in the world at the moment. So, can we increase the sustainability of an existing structure by by repairing it? I, I think we can. Um, the the basic premise of of a lot of um, uh, cathodic protection is that we we don't re remove chloride infected, if you like, material. We remove the loose. 
we look at how we can treat the uh, the the infection, if you like, with with cathodic protection, um, and keep that sound material, albeit encased with uh, chlorides, um, in place and protect the steels by by putting a cathodic protection system. So yes, I think the very quick answer is cathodic protection can be sustainable, but when it comes to, uh, for me, you'd have to look at it from a, a specific point of view. If it's a little bit, you know, and you need a lot, a big ICC piece and see system to, to, to solve that problem in an area, that's different to doing it over a massive area. So I suspect it is sustainable, but just sometimes not, but mostly yes. <laughs> Not that I'm sitting on the fence or anything. <laughs> so I, I, I disappeared up my own bottom then, sorry. <laughs> the, issue, the issue for me with all of this sustainability, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a mental state more than Catholic protection. Catholic protection only tends to be used currently in most of the world when the problem's already happened and we've seen corrosion on site. And you, you're at the sort of back end Exactly. of the problem really if if you think of an engineering solution and you're looking at i think maintenance proper maintenance and monitoring of structures is far bar, far more the better sustainable um solution because what you don't want to do is wait until your structure gets to a point where you've got to remove so much yeah. concrete now that it's that it's a problem and then to me it's a timing issue it's like when cathodic protection is best used when the corrosion rate is low yeah. And then eventually, if you think about the whole life cycle costing of that structure, you're going to extend the usability of that concrete, which is the biggest um, carbon loader, way, way out. So again, if you think of it in ultimate terms, putting cathodic protection in from day one is the best solution you can have because you, you limit yeah. the amount of variation and therefore um, the, the stability of that concrete in the, in the long term. The problem that comes into that always is cost. <laughs> people, people like talking about sustainability. People don't like the cost involved with sustainability, in my, in my humble opinion. I think it will get there, but I think at this moment in time, it's, it's, it's less so. Um, but cathodic protection, I think, is one one of the things that we can do to improve the carbon loading of our structures yeah. going forward. But I don't feel like it's the main the main one to to focus on. I think it's a bigger issue around everything that we that we do. The question really, would probably yeah. sorry, mate. The question would probably be better phrased as: Is cathodic prevention sustainable? Um, cathodic protection is at the back end, probably more. Yeah, cathodic prevention. Cathodic yes. prevention is actually uh, getting you to a more sustainable position. Yeah, one's one's preventive and one's reactive, realistically. And and as we um, pre, we can all all attest it in our career. We only get the phone call when concrete's dropping off. That's that's typically sure. when we sort of get involved. It's very rare that we get involved at day one in the structures. On the reverse side, though, the use of cathodic protection for chloride contaminated concrete means all the chloride contaminated concrete can remain. Can stay. So yeah. you're not replacing exactly. a large volume of concrete. So it does work out as then on the reverse side as well. Yep. I'm mindful, yeah. Laura, we've only got sort of 10 minutes left and we don't want to yeah. overdo people's <laughs> time. So yeah. back so. on. No worries. Well, as I said, if we if we do um if we do miss any questions, they will be answered in a in a post recording. So don't worry, uh, don't worry. We will we will answer all your questions. So number ten, um, when do you use GCP hybrids and ICCP? I'll take that if you want. That's great. Um, <coughs> it, it's it's almost the same question as when do you use steel structures and when do you use concrete structures. It, it entirely depends on the design and what you're trying to achieve. <clears throat> ICCP is a more complex install point, just attaching galvanics and you need an AC supply, but the anodes last longer and typically you'd expect them to work better with a higher chloride concentration. That being said, the cost of most repairs are physically getting there on site and getting the access in place. So you could look at the details of costs on this anode versus this anode, but you miss the point that you're spending 200,000 pounds to drop the structure anyway. So mm -hmm. you, you might want to go for a more durable repair. Mm -hmm. If you haven't got any power, then impressed current tends to become more costly just to get the power supply in place. So you start looking at galvanics and hybrids. Which one of those you use depends on what kind of life you want. What the levels of corrosion are, a hybrid's quite good because they give it a kick in the right direction first and then resort to the galvanic phase. So they may be an option. 
physically it, it's there's a vast range of things you can consider and it, it's never going to be a single right it's a bridge we will use this it's a half joint we will use this it's a whole design decision process that needs to be yeah. and i think i think that's what it comes down to all the time is it's not a tick box you can't just say a b c equals d yeah. and that's it that's just not how engineering works really and as you say there's a technical element there's a commercial element of it and there's a there's, a, there's an achievability element of, of any decision that we make with all these systems and they all have their advantages they all have their limitations that's the that's the reality there's no perfect system out there yeah okay thanks guys um i just refer you to the chat box and um, we've had uh, a question in from lucy that links to that actually so iccp and concrete in uk sectors of the news projects bridges civil buildings etc are there many projects on new or existing structures it's almost all repairing of existing structures. There's very few new build ICCP going in. Some of the some of the newer, more high profile structures, they're making all the steel and electrically continuous as part of the installation process. And occasionally you get new structures that need repair. But mostly ICCP, it's concrete repair. Yeah, I think it does depend, just to add to that, I think it depends on where you are around, around the world. I mean, in Italy, it's the other way around. It's nearly all new construction and less less repair. So I think there is, a, but I think globally, I think as a general statement, I think it's nearly all repair and remediation as opposed to new. Fantastic, thank you. And I hope that answered your question, Lucy. Um, right, we'll move on to question 11. How do you know if your existing cathodic protection system is working as it's supposed to be, which is always useful? It's going to take that. I'll take that. As I, as I teach CP courses, um, there's an international training course and certification scheme for cathodic protection personnel. So a level one just takes readings, a level two takes readings and thinks about it a bit, a level three writes method statements, a level four is a designer. At a level five is um, not used in the UK is probably the best description of it. Um, <clears throat> basically, you get someone who knows about CP to come and check it's working. And uh, the cathodic protection standards have a series of tests that you can do to demonstrate that the system meets the requirements of the European standard that says it's protected. Occasionally, as you go down the monitoring route, some of the monitoring breaks down, some of the probes break down. Sometimes it's not quite protected enough and then it becomes a more of an engineering decision as to whether you turn it off or whether you can accept that it's not quite working to meet the codes, but it is probably still giving you some benefit. Anybody got anything else on that? No, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, probably brings you on to the maintenance side, uh, I, I guess, um, because for me, the when you're looking at these sorts of things you're talking about how do you maintain a uh, a system you know obviously you you're going through and the, the the making sure it works is one thing but then making sure that everything else works is another and what i mean by that is that yes you can do these potential measurements and you can you can check the system is actually working but there are there are other things as well chris mentioned there about the probes um, failing, which which they do sometimes, the silver silver chloride reference electrodes and all that sort of thing, they do fail sometimes, of course. Um, but really, when you're going to visit those sites, there are key points. You know, visual inspection of visible components: are the wires in good nick? Are are the uh, uh, are they being vandalized? Are the are the TRs working properly? Is there rust on the Lucy cabinets? Uh, you know, are there is there rust on the actual components that are not being protected but are being used to make the system work? Uh, making sure the power system's working, making sure the computers are actually working if it's a remote monitoring uh, system. So it's also sort of ident identifying sort of potential short circuits uh, and just make, you know making sure that you know we're not seeing sort of unusual corrosion on the system with sort of discontinuous items that may not have been picked up in the install so you know for all those sorts of things you know these systems age when we think about a, a cathodic protection system the components the 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 anodes will are what 120 year life chris um yeah. well that's yeah. not specifically because we can't work out if titanium is ever going to break down exactly but 
how long is the TR going to last? The Tyrannosaurus, the Tyrannosaurus, the Transformers, Tyrannosaurus Recticus. <laughs> it's easy for me to say. Transformer Rectifier. Is that is that actually working? You know, I mean, for, for me, that 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 you know, it, it will only last. 20, 30 years, won't it? You know, regardless, the cables themselves, how are they faring? Are we are we protecting those? Are we looking at their their uh, their condition? So for me, that that's another issue in terms of ensuring existing cathodic protection is working is whether we're maintaining it or not, whether it looks like it's it's working as much as it if it is working. Sorry, I just thought I'd add that. <laughs> Thank you, the they can be usually replaced quite yeah. easily. Because Cool. they're accessible so that's the plan is everything we embed we embed with spur capacity and everything that we've got in a box outside we design it to last kind of 25 years and then replace yeah. it okay great thank you guys i'm glad someone else is struggling with their words today so <laughs> not alone um all right we'll move on to question 12 again mindful that we're coming up to the hour but uh, we might go just ever so slightly over um so what are the long-term maintenance requirements of cathodic protection who would like that one i think oh, i've yeah. just answered that one yeah. sorry I think, it was a, I think it was a double whammy on that on, yeah on yeah because because obviously i sort of added on to chris's and yeah. it looks like a I think I've probably covered that. Yeah, yeah. Check, it, check it all. Right. Do a visual inspection. Check the AC. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think I think just on that one though, Lauren. Before we jump off, mm -hmm. I think it's one of the things that historically has been poorly understood in terms of. I always say like an ICCP system is for for life, not just for Christmas, and it, and it really is. I think if you if you're going into use cathodic protection of any kind, you have to be aware that there are long-term maintenance requirements and you have to budget for those long-term maintenance requirements. If you don't, you're setting yourself up for fail for, for day one, really. It's a clear requirement. Um, and I just think it, it's, it really needs to be, to be pushed. All systems need monitoring. All systems need some sort of maintenance. It doesn't matter whether it's galvanic, hybrid, or ICCP. Uh, it's just one of those things that has to be considered up front. And it's one of the sort of like risk assessments that typically has to be done up front is, is this company, is this owner, is this engineer going to monitor this system long term? And if the answer to that is no, then it's not, you can't do anything. It's more the fact that certain systems lend themselves one way or the other. If it's really, really important, if it's really going to be looked after and it's got a maintenance program in place for 25, 30 years, then another system is definitely going to be the way you want to go if that's what you're trying to achieve. So I do think that's a really important question that has to be answered and understood fully before any system is um, is advised on a, on a structure. But equally, it's not a big burden and it's normally designed in. It's like having a fire alarm in your house and checking it's working. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. It's not a big burden, but it's the easiest thing to go misplace. Yeah. It's the easiest thing to not pay the bill, the easiest thing to not pay the phone line or whatever it may be. Those are the easiest things to, to, to miss off. And it's not the technology that's at fault, then it's the monitoring and the maintenance, which is, which is at fault. Okay. Thank you guys. Um, we are gonna to have to make this our last question. Obviously you've, you've seen that teaser now, so we will answer it. So why are galvanic anodes installed into concrete patch repairs and how does this compare with other cathodic protection methods? Well, we're gonna end on a big one then. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you're gonna go out, you might as well go out. <laughs> go out, go out, yeah, go out on a high. Um, I mean, realistically, the, the, the technology is identical. There's no difference between galvanic protection and ICCP when it comes to the method of protection. Um, I think that's really, really important. How they work is very different. And obviously galvanic systems were first developed 21 years ago to combat this, this, this phenomenon that, that, that contractors, engineers were seeing upon on timings. When we went on to repairs and we, we expected that we did them all properly we sa two and a half proper cover broke behind good bond we were finding that the outside of the repairs were breaking down and, and this went on for, for years really and it's very difficult to predict the life of, of a repair because of this phenomenon and basically with time people realized it was something what we call now is incipient anode formation or ring anode formation depending on where you are and and this occurs because when we if you think about when we do a repair we're taking out where the corrosion was occurring. But realistically, that, that, that patch was actually protecting the rest of the, the, the steel around it. And we've come along, we've taken it out, we've cleaned up the steel, we've removed chloride, we've put back a nice, fresh 
repair material to 1504, it's high alkalinity. That steel in that patch now is only going to be passive. But what we've left behind, and this is typically when we look at chloride more than anything, is we've left behind parent concrete that still has that still has corrosion or chloride in it. And therefore you're setting up a potential difference, a drive voltage, if you want, between the old and the new. And with time, what happens is you tend to find that the outside corrodes and protects the patch. And that's what we call the incipient anode formation. So what we're in this position is it's not cathodic protection in terms of corrosions occurring, it's in the cathodic prevention realm again. So we're trying to prevent the, the steel from corroding on the outside of the patch. And galvanics, because of their limited voltage, because of their, their, their simplicity, I mean, you could do this with impressed current cathodic protection. You could, you could protect patches with impressed current cathodic protection. It's probably not the most cost-effective way of doing it, and hence why galvanics were really used in that sense, because they were installed, you covered them over, they provide protection um, to the steel, prevented it from corrosion, extend the life of the um, of the repair. And, and that's typically probably globally the biggest market for galvanic systems remains in this patch repair, um, uh, patch repair scenario, really. Um, and things like Highways England now have included this as a standard spec. It's included within the ISO standard in the notes in terms of cathodic prevention. Uh, and typically, as we've said, with new construction, which is cathodic prevention and patch repair, um, it's typically a lot lower um, current densities. The amount of current we have to pass onto the steel is far low with prevention, which again lends itself for galvanics. And that's typically why I, I think they're used more, more often than not now. I'm pretty sure, Chris, you've got something else to say on there, and, and same as you, Graham. So I said, my well, general. Basically, it just mops up a bit of chloride around the edge of the edge of the repair. So it, it it's something you can do because the cost of a repair is the cost of getting there and doing something. It's something you can do yeah. fairly quickly, fairly informally that will buy you an improved repair. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Fine with that. Okay. okay. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Um, just a big thank you to you all for, for joining us today um, and, and answering those questions. And to you guys at home um, who have been watching, I hope it's been useful for you. Uh, thank you for submitting the questions live and also the pre um, asked questions that you submitted. As I have said, they will be uh, the remainder will be answered. Uh, post post event so please keep an eye on uh, the websites for that um, just very quickly I uh, just wanted to share with you some further reading because I know some of you have asked that on the chat so um, if I can refer you to the CPA website uh, there are uh, a suite of documents on there um, including the, uh, the CPA technical notes um, so please do uh, please do go to the website for that and uh, obviously you will get information there of uh, events other technical doc technical documents and the uh, the training suite as well so all that remains for me to say is is, is thank you very much uh, next week we have the spray concrete webinar uh, on the 6th of may same time um, so please register for that if that's of interest um, there will be a series in the autumn as well which we will be running um, so again, keep an eye on the website for updates on that. So finally, all I've got to say is that there is a quick feedback form at the end of this, uh, uh, the end of this uh, webinar, which you will be taken to. Um, there is a whopping twenty pounds Amazon voucher on 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 hand for for. for for completion it will be picked at random so uh, as if we haven't given Amazon enough money through this lockdown uh, let's let's give them some more um, so please it, it does help us for future events um, it really is essential to tailor these uh, ask for specialist sessions um, and, and other kind of events as well so it really is invaluable to us um, to have that information so I will leave you now thank you very much hope you all have a, a great day and um, take care Thank Cheers. You, Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Bye-bye.